update first. Um, we're going to do a recovery team meeting this morning. Um, just a reminder to everybody in the call that we are recording these uh, meetings and that they um, will be uh, posted out on the county's website. So um, just a reminder there. Um, also a reminder, uh, we sent another reminder this morning about the equity training um, to register for either the 24th or the 27th, um, and then also the, re the reading materials. And once you've uh, uh, seen the video and, and, did, and finished with the reading, just let us know in emergency management, we're keeping track of, um, of people that have completed that, that assignment. So. Um, today, this morning, we'd like to get through uh, some brief out and conversation around recovery and the RSFs, but then um, I'm going to ask the recovery coordination team um, to stay on the call after and talk about education and a potential education um, unified command. Um, so um, with that being said, um, let's just uh, move right into a, a brief out with economic recovery, Steve or Diane. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, uh, a little slow getting the mute off. Uh, I'll, I'll start out and then Diane can certainly add. Um, those of you who aren't aware, we have scheduled uh, for the RSF1 uh, CARES Act effort. We have meetings tomorrow and also on Thursday. We have a Zoom call at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. I anticipate it'll be an hour and a half maybe uh, be kind of open-ended to allow questions, et cetera. And then we also have one scheduled for 6.30 on Thursday evening to go over the process, uh, you know, the, the application process, to talk a little bit about the, the CARES Act in general, uh, also to give folks some updates on, or information on the equity piece of the application. Uh, so we're really scrambling to put things together we've made a lot of progress in the last couple of days. So I think we're getting in pretty good shape, but uh, moving on that. And uh, I know Diane, you have anything to add kind of in, in, in terms of the, the meetings Wednesday and Thursday? The only thing I would add is that if, if you all can help us um, share out the, uh, the information that was posted out through various outlets, you know, through your own outlets, we're trying to have as wide of a, of a net cast to the business community and then any organization that doesn't otherwise fall under another RSF. And obviously that is a huge universe in all of Douglas County. So any help that you can get by sharing that out um, by, by hopping on either the chamber social media, I think the county shared it out, the city of Lawrence shared it out and share it out further, we would really appreciate that. Um, our deadline for submissions uh, will be noon on Thursday, July 30th. And, and then before we leave, I did want to give a shout out to, to the other folks, in addition to, to uh, Diane and I have been working on this. Jasmine and Paula and Ryan and Britt have really, really been helpful. In fact, they've carried a lot of the weight. So it's been a really good effort and really happy and proud for what they've done. Thank you, Steve. Uh, anybody have any um, further conversation around economic recovery or anything for um, Diane or Steve? Okay, great. Um, RSF2, uh, Beth or Tracy? This is Beth. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I want to start out by saying appreciation, a lot of appreciation to, to Brooke Sauer, who's tried to um, help us in the health and medical understand direct aid and that wider opportunity to um, recover expenses already incurred by our health and medical system. Um, getting our messages right in, a, in an RSF that will consume a lot, could, we can anticipate, we'll have a lot of requests um, for, our, for our pandemic and our response as well as going forward um, has, uh, um, it's been extremely helpful to get her support so that the forms are clear. Um, on top of that, we're working, we're focusing our efforts 
to make sure that we have a coordinated testing response. Um, and then we're, we're working to make sure that in the broadest sense of uh, mitigation, that we can support the community. Um, I know that Charlie later will offer some more clarification. We have asked everyone to submit their, um, the breadth of PPE that they need through their own budgets. And then uh, logistics is trying to look at how they can um, also support and understand what our broader needs are. Um, that's been a big element of our organizing. Um, we are trying to be responsive within that guidance to other um, um, organizations within RSF three in particular or two. Uh, three that are relying on, can we get more testing and surveillance testing? That's probably been the other biggest source of a lot of questions late in last week and even this week. So we're working to capture that within our coordinated testing and surveillance testing response. So Tracy, anything else that you would add to that? I'm not sure Tracy's on. Yeah, I don't see her on yet either. Okay, yeah. I would leave it at that unless Russ, there's anything else in the, really per, the medical system that you think everyone needs to hear at this juncture. Nothing yet. Okay. I I had a question real quick though, Beth. This is Jill Jolliker. Can you? Can you give me a mini explanation of what, what surveillance testing is, what you mean by that? Just because I know it's, it's come up in a couple conversations and I just wanted some clarity. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Sonia, to speak to that. Surveillance is when we are looking for um, potential cases. So contact tracing is a form of surveillance, um, looking throughout the community for different potential cases. So when we do surveillance testing, it's different than symptomatic testing where we've identified somebody that we want to get tested or who thinks they should be tested. It means that we're going out into the community and we're just doing a broad swath of the population or a targeted like at the shelter or something like that at a long-term care facility, for instance, we're looking for cases through testing as part of our surveillance. Perfect. Thank you. And that's, that's what I was trying to understand. And that's, that it's different. Um, and that's what the request is that I think there were just some concerns from some of the, I, I don't know if they're concerns or not, but I think that they're still looking for some clarity about whether or not they are, will be able to have that level of, if, is the, is the expectation appropriate for them to have, for there to be surveillance in facilities like First Step, the shelter, things like that. Um, it sounds like there's still some um, anxiety there around that. <laughs> yeah, I would say that um, there's still a lot of planning that needs to be done around um, those types of situations and regarding surveillance testing in general for our community or universal testing or however you, you want to call it, mass testing. Um, however, you know, if they did test somebody positive in a shelter situation or at first step or any type of high risk congregate care setting, I think it is reasonable to expect that we would um, be approved for asymptomatic, asymptomatic testing of the whole population. So I think that step at least is reasonable if you have that first positive case. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Beth, anybody have any other questions or, or conversation around RSF2? I, I see Andrew has, Foster has put out a question, Sonia, to everybody um, around saliva testing and the use of that modality. We are exploring our testing machine options. It depends on um, a variety of factors, including, you know, what um, certification we currently have for a lab at the health department without having to get new certification, um, what the reliability is, um, 
ease of use, whether the supplies are available, not just the machine. So there's a lot that we are looking into. Um, but I do know that the goal is to have some type of um, rapid test. And so it would be less likely to be um, the oral pharyngeal or the nasal pharyngeal swab. Yeah, uh, my apologies. I meant to send that direct to Sonia, but no it's a good question for everybody. No problem. Um, but no problem. If, if that is something that we can assist with, the health system um, has formed a pretty good relationship for saliva based testing and should have the FDA approval for the, the EUA here um, within the week. So um, we can talk offline about that if you haven't already been talking with Watkins Health. Yeah, I would actually recommend um, coordinating with Linda Craig on it as she's our lead for that process right now. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay, if there's nothing further there, let's move on to uh, Housing and Human Services. Jill? Hi. Um, last week, um, we did two webinars with our Human Services Coalition um, audience and a whole lot more, I think, um, on the CARES Act funding and how um, we were going to use our initial planning document and the focus areas that we'd outlined to make those decisions um, and then how um, utilizing how to use the fill out the form for the state and then how to um, fill, and then doing the equity impact assessment. Um, and now it's just been answering questions um, from the different agencies um, and also relying on um, sussing out different um, questions that Brooke has helped with as well. So I want to echo the gratitude to Brooke for help, all her help. But um, yeah, we're just focused on, uh, we're going to be reviewing um, our, our deadline is this Friday for all those proposals to be to us uh, by 8 a.m. We're going to be reviewing those proposals. Um, so we can make an initial recommendation to uh, of high, medium, and low rankings at our Monday meeting of the RSF3 group, and then we'll have recommendations for this group. And that's really all I have. Um, I brought up my question about the surveillance testing, and that was really all I had that's emerged. Thank you, Jill. Anything for Jill or Shannon? Julie or Andrew for RSF4? I'm not sure if Julie's on today. Um, I think she had took a couple days off, which was well deserved, I'm sure. Um, it, for RSF4, um, people should start, their submissions um, should be rolling in starting tomorrow through Friday. Um, and Friday, we're gonna start reviewing those um, as we move forward. Um, the big one that's being worked on right now, I think, is uh, centered around uh, child care, which is both early childhood and mm -hmm. um, child care for those individuals that won't be in school due to the late start um, as the uh, economy and particularly as universities open back up, um, the workforce needs child care uh, to get back to business. And so um, we've been working with John Wilson from Kansas Action for Children to uh, assist with developing a plan for how to extend child care throughout the community. Um, and, and I think we're getting a pretty good idea. So hopefully we'll have something to bring back um, in the near future. Other than that, I've gotten a number of, of questions um, recently about um, the equity tool. Um, so we've been working through that just to make sure that everybody is submitting that and verifying their projects um, appropriately so that we um, are being as equitable as possible. Um, not a lot of other updates besides that. Thank you, Andrew. I know that the CARES Act um, process is consuming a lot of time in, in the RSFs. And um, if you want to move on to Brooke, can you give us, speaking of CARES Act, uh, any update on where you're at? Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Brooke. Um, yes, I do have a couple of things that I want to talk about. Um, this morning, and then I also have a question for our leaders um, in this group. Uh, first, I'll let you guys know, um, last Wednesday during 
our call with the Office of Recovery, um, they released a new template for both reimbursement and direct aid. Um, I want to let everybody know that those new templates are available. Um, and I've talked with a lot of you guys, too, just on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you've called me and I've told you about it, but I just want to remind everybody to use that new form. Um, the direct aid planning template has one of the larger changes to the template. Um, and what they've done is they've changed one of the tabs. There's now a program tab and then there is a transfer tab. And the difference between the two is that the program tab uh, would be something that is competitive. So there's an application process. Um, you know, people who would be receiving that money would, it would have to go through some sort of a process to um, get that funding. The transfer tab is more of a general, you know, I need, PPE, this is how much it's going to cost, and then that there's no application process. It's not a competitive grant process. Um, so that's the difference between those two tabs. Um, another thing that I want to let this group know about um, that's really important to me is that um, these funds are subject to uniform guidance. Um, and specifically the uniform guidance, the Code of Federal Regulations that talks about subrecipient monitoring, um, which the county does have a policy in place to handle subrecipient monitoring. But there is a couple of things that I'm going to ask each agency who receives money to complete. Um, county staff has been working on um, a risk assessment tool questionnaire. And basically, any agency that will receive funds um, will be provided a link to a survey where you'll just answer a couple of questions um, about your organization, and it will help me make sure that I'm following my policy when it comes to the subrecipient monitoring. So I just wanted to get that out of there, out there that 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 is something that will will be looking to do, and we've really tried hard to make the process easy um, for everybody to do. Um, the, the question that I have, is, it, it relates to the racial equity tool um, and how, how we're asking people who are submitting their direct aid requests to use that tool as it relates to specific line items within their request. Are we asking that they fill out one form for each program or transfer tab, or are we asking them to fill out the form for, um, you know, each line item on their transfer program tab? We've been asking people in RSF4 to do one per program. RSF2 okay. is our health and medical has done the exact same thing. And that most organizations will be submitting one program tab that captures uh, expenses. Same for three. For one, we'll have um, each um, each proposal submit either the program or the um, or the the other transfer tab um, information. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much for helping me understand that process because I kind of came in to this group a little bit late in the game and I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, expressing what, what's required to some of uh, the folks who I've been in contact with. So um, I, that's, I think that's it for me today. Um, I'll stand for any questions, so if anybody has something they'd like to ask. Okay, not, not hear anything. Thank you, Brooke. Appreciate it. Um, I'm not, I don't see Jeremy on. Um, Casey, do you have an, uh, an update for us for Equity Impact? 
you kind of stole my equity impact thunder, Robert, but just <laughs> reminding folks to register today for the uh, training and um, to do their homework in advance. Uh, the toolkit had a couple of questions about uh, what the most recent version was. Just wanted to clarify that it's dated 716. Uh, so that's the most recent one. Um, I think Brooke put it out on the county's COVID web webpage and it should be on our SharePoint site. So if folks are having trouble find it, uh, finding it, let us know. Um, and then between now and next week, the advisors are um, available to help their RSFs um, as needed. That's the update, but we're happy to answer questions. Okay. Not seeing or hearing any questions. Thank you, Casey. And Charlie, are you able to give us an update on logistics? Sure can. So I was in a conversation, a uh, couple conversations this last um, several days about PPE for the CARES Act, CARES Act proposals that people are putting together. And given that we have the data from our survey that we do every week, um, it was suggested that it could be useful to take that data to give some sense of what's the utilization going on and what might that translate to if we were to put a cost figure to it. So looking at the reports that I send out, uh, it does look like in the last couple weeks that uh, usage has gone up. So I, instead of taking the average over the length of the survey, I just took the last two weeks and um, assumed 150 days. So that would put us August through December and then got pricing data from McKesson, who is a, a medical supplies distributor that the health department uses and is um, likely used by others in town. Um, and then projected from that data what the total cost would could be if we were to, as a community, um, purchase the PPE at the rate that we're currently utilizing it. So <clears throat> altogether, that's about $800,000. I would say what's not included in this are PPE um, usage from organizations that are not participating in the weekly PPE survey. There are 43 organizations, and that was um, in the email. There are 43 that have been participating uh, in the last couple of weeks. Some of those are um, from the original list that uh, was put together through the um, Human Services Group back when we were under Unified Command. A few of them have continued to make requests, such as uh, the Community Shelter, um, the Children's Shelter, Salvation Army, a couple food pantries. Um, Just Food has done this survey on occasion, but they haven't, they don't um, participate every week. So they're not in the last two weeks of data. And then most of it is healthcare and long term care and first responders. Um, of course, also the city of Lawrence, um, KU is also in that list. So I think it represents a, big, a pretty large section of organizations in the community that have been using PPE, but I want to recognize that there might be others out there that haven't been involved with logistics. Therefore, this data doesn't reflect kind of a projected usage from those organizations. Charlie, did you say, um, I, you kind of cut out on me when you gave that number, was it 300,000 or 800,000? 800,000. So eight, eight. Yeah, 800,000. Thank you. Yep. And then Charlie, what was the time frame for calculating that? Was that just like a two week period or was that for a different period of time? So the time frame for the calculation was I used the average of the last two weeks of data, but the estimate is assuming 150 days of operations. So that would be August through December. I was just looking at assuming, I don't know when the funds would be here, but it would, we can change that 150 days to whatever time frame people want. Um, Charlie, you mentioned that, that you think you're capturing the, the vast majority of, of the needs. Is, are, you, are you thinking that, that with those that aren't reporting into this process, is that 
more than what, it, you know, I was just curious how much is, is out there that maybe isn't being captured with the, the ongoing reporting process. I would say the biggest group that has not um, been involved in uh, the PPE requesting are probably schools. As we talk about this as a recovery team, um, and and honestly, probably some of those businesses that are making their purchases, um, that and I think this is where the other RSFs, when they're putting forward their proposals, they might want to anticipate like what those PPE purchase uh, needs would look like. Um, I don't know in the structure of the proposal if all PPE funds need to be put into a single line item or if they need to be separated out by RSF. I, I would say mostly this represents RSF2. And then there are probably some of the, I don't know which RSF it is, I think it's three. There's probably some overlap with three. Okay, thank you. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have like a percent. I, I don't have a sense of how many organizations are represented in the other RSFs. Thank you, Charlie. Hey, quick question. The, um, the health board approved last night. Is there a plan for how that will be stored or distributed? The 10,000 masks? I don't know where we're going to store it, but we'll probably figure out a place. Okay. And I don't know the distribution plan either. But okay. Robert, this is Beth. Us, Robert. <laughs> Robert, that that initial thinking was particularly about um, probably two populations, but folks that may not have access to a mask, and there's some concern as a vulnerable population. Um, um, that included children and that included, do we have other priority organizations that may need distribution to members of the community? So it wasn't like staff creating a same safe space, but do we need to create a cash? And these aren't throwaways. So it's not like the surgical one-time use simple. It, it was the idea of a more um, permanent mask for certain populations priority populations as we're opening um, outside of particularly young school children and without having the time to coordinate through RSF4, it was part one of the ideas that Dan was like, what do we need to make sure of? And outside what the United Way has been doing a great job of repurposing masks into the community. It was that kind of a, a safety net. So to figure out the logistics and depending on where this process goes and the school plans, that's the thinking to date, knowing that you've, you've got to build out more, especially since, you know, it was publicly reported. We're trying to create a safety net, not create more public confusion, if that helps. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh-huh. Robert, Robert uh, just one thing I wanted to, oh, go ahead, Russ. Um, I just wondered if um, the pricing information uh, should serve as guidance for any of us who may have elements of PPE in our requests. Should we use that pricing and have kind of a uniform standard across all requests or are there thoughts on that um, yeah, so either I, now or that we could take offline? I, th I think it would be helpful to maybe broaden the discussion about that. And we, we maybe can talk about that in our logistics call this afternoon. The pricing I got was to be able to give you guys at least an initial stab at um, what might it look like if we were to think about this, you know, broadly. I think um, on the logistics call, we have KU, uh, City of Lawrence, the fire department and the hospital um, and United Way. So if they have different pricing, that'd be useful. One thing I wanted to add is when we think about um, the capacity to make these purchases, it is not as straightforward as saying, well, let's, let's have logistics um, buy everything. Um, the problem is there are existing contracts that restrict who can buy what, and the suppliers or the distributors, um, they are using a system of allotments right now. So 
essentially they'll tell us if we didn't, if you didn't previously buy this stuff from us, then we're not going to open the gate for you to buy it. And so that's affecting anyone's ability to just make large bulk purchases. So it's probably important to consider like agencies need to maintain their own ability to make these purchases. And when it's appropriate for logistics to um, do a bulk purchase or when it's even feasible, then you know, that's probably a good idea. Um, but we, we probably can't take over purchasing for everyone. Um, I don't know that we'd get any economy of scale for doing that. And I don't know that we would actually be able to do that with the relationships we have with sources. So that would be like the hospital needs to continue doing what they're doing to purchase their own products. I, I think in our conversations about this, we talked about possibly having a finance component where people seek reimbursement and maybe finance um, gives a kind of an all clear to certain pricing. Um, if it's below that, then good. If it's above it, then stop before you proceed um, because you won't necessarily be reimbursed at a higher rate than maybe what finance determines initially. Um, that might be a way to put all of us in the same boat. We can purchase at a certain price point or expect to be reimbursed at a certain price point. Charlie, one thing I would say for the CARES Act is that like, I'm not sure we're going to have time to be that precise. So, and if there, as long as there's some money that it comes from an agency for submission in the plan for that type of purpose, and if we have to move it around for different contracts or purposes, we can do that. I'm just worried that we need to have a placeholder inside the CARES Act for that, for that purchase. I, I agree. Yeah, whether it's done by 10 people or it's done by one person, it's it's mostly right now about the placeholder. That, that, that was kind of the intent of getting this out there was, here's the data we have, and we can at least give you a rough stab of what a placeholder would look like. Um, but I recognize that there's some things missing. And then figuring out how the purchasing, that, that can all be done later, I think. Charlie, it looks like you're able to pull uh, like a generalized burn rate for the community uh, per day out of this data, just averaging it out. Um, do you also have any um, ability to do like the aggregated data for uh, burn rate per organization? I know that some of the schools have had questions about how uh, much PPE that they're going to burn through a day. And that's the, the USDs, I think, as they're submitting their requests up for direct aid, they're going to have some PPE requests in there that will all be um, combined up in some way, but I, I don't know that anyone has a real good estimation. So if you can help us out with um, what you think an expected burn rate for a USD might be, that would be advantageous to talk about. We, we definitely have the data to show like burn rates by organization um, averaged over the last several weeks. I, I'm not entirely sure, um, you know, the size, the number of employees, the number of uh, students and such that would be needed to calculate that burn rate. But as Russ was saying, I think we could at least give a guidance on what the pricing maybe should be. Yeah. Um, and if it's helpful at all, we can share, you know, burn rates by organization. Okay, thanks. We might engage you directly on that and see if we can get you to help out a little. All right. Great work, by the way, this looks fantastic. It's, it's good stuff. Thank you. And Charlie, I think to add to that, or at least the question is, will public health, or is there anything in the KSDE document that provides guidance on what kind of PPE would be required or recommended, and would public health provide any recommendations for that? That might also help the USDs determine how much they're going to need based on a minimum standard of some kind. I don't have the answer to that. We could look into that. Thank you, George, or Charlie. George is up next. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. I had um, George in my mind. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> we'll find out. Um, most of the heavy lifting for the recovery process and the CARES Act information, um, Carrie, Britt, Douglas County has been handling that, um, posting on the Douglas County Hub, um, then obviously the fellow PIOs in our organizational um, channels and and other avenues have been sharing that information with the community. Um, a lot of the, our work still has also been on just on the back to that response, just given our 
um, case numbers lately within the past month. Um, and then just sharing kind of, I believe since we talked last, we have rolled out that seven day average um, graph instead of the data daily case count, um, which still is on the health department website, but the average, I mean, just sharing that message of how our averages have gone down um, since we had that spike um, stemming from June and then early July. Um, so we've kind of used that, that messaging to point to the effectiveness of the recent health orders um, with the bars closing and then the masking order. Um, but I mean, the smart and safe messaging has never gone away and probably is more important now and will be. Um, just continue to share those messages in different ways um, on health order compliance, obviously masking, social distancing, just doing as much as everyone can to be smart and safe and so that we can keep as much of our community open. Um, and then the, la the third, I guess the more formal piece with that is we have um, been working on a couple communication campaigns uh, with a couple different audiences in mind. So this has been required since last week. Um, we had a, we have one with a, um, working with a KU student advertising group. Um, so they're, the target audience would be that, you know, young adult, um, college student, just on smart and safe behavior, um, how to reinforce that message, um, especially in off-campus situations. Um, so just socializing out in the community um, to try to, to reinforce that. So we're going to circle back with them, I believe, on Thursday and start rolling that out. Um, and then the, the broader one is uh, we have a conversation tomorrow with the current marketing group. Um, so the broader community, smart and safe messaging, um, especially geared at parents of, of K through 12 students. Um, just anything, you know, that all those, those messages, anything that we can do to, to reinforce, um, obviously protecting hospital capacity, the vulnerable populations, um, but just everyone doing the right, you know, being smart and safe um, and all those, those practices so that we can um, be as successful as we can and keep things open um, without having, you know, as we go on long-term. Hey George, for the messaging that you're working on for um, college age students, have you been engaging with any of our public affairs folks? To um, yeah, Barcom Peterson has been um, working with us on that. So we've kept her in the loop to try to make help that uh, synergy with the on campus and KU message too. So. Okay, great. If you need any help with that, let me know. And uh, well, I know you know Andy Highland and them as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, George. Appreciate it. Anybody else have anything for George? Um, in the chat, uh, Jillian put the um, the links for the uh, equity training. Um, in case you didn't see it in the email, it's there in the chat. Uh, you want to paste it out. Um, anything from the coordination team? Okay. Anything from anybody for the good of the order? I'd like to ask um, Craig and Sarah, Russ, Bonnie, to stay on the call. I don't see Dan or um, Dr. Lewis or Dr. Gerard, but um, if you just stay on the call and we can discuss, um, have to finish our discussion from Friday. Robert, do you think we owe this group a little bit of a preview of what that is. I think we do. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. So, um, so on Friday, um, we met, I say we, uh, Craig and Sarah, Dr. Gerard, Dr. Lewis, um, Dan Partridge to talk about um, a collaborative, collaborative effort and education and, and getting the um, schools and colleges um, open. Um, and so uh, in that conversation, we talked about a potential um, unified command. That's the term we all know, but a, a structure that we could all know and work with to work with each other. So um, out of that meeting uh, uh, yesterday, um, we, uh, we came up with, I say we, Jillian, um, um, Andrew and John from KU Emergency Management uh, came up with a draft uh, chart on what that uh, unified command would look like and uh, also some objectives to get it started. So that's why I'm asking this group to stay on the, on, on the call to, to continue working through that structure and those objectives and uh, hopefully um, 
hopefully you'll see something real soon um, in that collaborative way of, of for education specifically. Um, one, one thing about um, a structure like this when it comes to um, the specific topic education is that it, we know there's going to be an end and, and that, that's, that's good. There's light at the end of the tunnel. So um, whereas in the last one we did, we weren't sure where it was going to end or when it was going to end. So anybody have any questions about that? We'll report back more as we uh, get, it, get it set up and get going. Just wanted to, um, this is Casey, just wanted to take an opportunity to elevate equity and make sure that that would be a continued uh, part of the work that that group would do. Yep, thank you, Casey, appreciate that. We will. Okay, if there's, if there's nothing else, then if those few would stay on the line and we'll go from there, we'll see and talk to everybody next week. Hey, Robert, mm -hmm. Paula. Um, I know you're probably going to get tired of me asking the same question. Um, ha has there been efforts to reach out to the Haskell Indian Nations University folks? Regarding the um, education structure? Yeah. 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 Not, not yet. Um, I think we're in, uh, in get, going to get the structure together to start with, but they will definitely be included as well as um, Baker um, and KU. So um, for a higher level. Well, I'd say if you have any ins or folks that you know we can contact, we always appreciate a good contact. Absolutely, Sarah. I'll send you something. Thank you. A couple names. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sarah. And Paula, I talk with Tanya Silvini over there pretty often. That was her who called earlier when I was on the, this call, so um, I have that contact already. Okay. Thank you. Where is this?